How about now? <laughs> User error. Yeah, I don't know why it wouldn't work. I mean, come on. <laughs> Just uh, give me a thumbs up when you get back. Thanks, Ed. All right, well, let's assume that taking the audio actually, come on in, grab a seat. There's one more, two more available, so that's great. Again, um, we are not going to be doing anything that requires you to log on to a machine uh, today. Um, I want to speed through a number of other things just to give you an orientation of sort of what resources we have, some hopefully you didn't think uh, were even available, and they are. So I'm just gonna go into display mode and we'll get started here. Okay, great. Well, welcome to an introduction to MSI. Uh, my name is Jim Wilgenbush. I'm the uh, Senior Associate uh, Director of MSI. I've been at the University of Minnesota for about three years. So has anyone been here any longer than I have been? Really? Awesome. Okay. Wh wh what keeps you here so long? <laughs> this is my fifth year. Fifth year. Fantastic. And what program are you in? Educational psychology, great. And you're in a graduate program? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Well, welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, who here is a graduate student? Raise your hand if you're a graduate student. Great, okay. Who here is a faculty member? Staff or faculty? Staff or faculty, yes. Great, okay, fantastic. Are there any undergraduates here then? Postdoc is not an undergraduate, so good we have one other category and an undergraduate and a staff member. No, you're a postdoc also and a staff member, yes. Well, great, really fantastic to have you here and a really good diverse um, uh, set of circumstances. Um, today really is about sort of giving you the mile high picture of what you can do with MSI resources, right? There are a whole set of tutorials, which I'll show at the very end, that actually give you a much greater depth of knowledge of the things that I will simply touch upon today, right? So if there's something, for example, that I bring up with respect to interactive computing, there's a whole two-hour section that involves um, uh, you logging in, you using a lot of the stuff that we have that you can attend. That is not today, though. Today is just zero prerequisites. You get an idea of what resources are available and, and hopefully you're, you're better for it. So um, first of all, just sort of a little, uh, a little background. Um, MSI is part of the Office of the Vice President of Research. Um, we're technically listed as an academic unit in the OBPR, but we very much provide services um, as well as doing research. And so most of the time, people who come to these tutorials are really interested in the services that we provide. But it's good for you to know that we also actually do um, research in high performance computing uh, and also sort of data intensive research. Uh, we have about uh, 40, a little actually over 40 full-time employees. Uh, those employees actually have backgrounds very similar to yours. So at least half of our staff um, have completed their uh, PhD work in some computational science typically. And, and so they're here uh, not only to serve you, but then also to work directly with the faculty typically on funded research projects. And so many of the folks here uh, understand sort of where you are right now if you're in a graduate program or for that matter even if you're in a postdoc um, position right now. Uh, we have, we serve actually, this is a little bit out of date I see, we actually have about 4,000 users annually who are actively use it, using MSI systems. We, insert, we serve the entire University of Minnesota campus and then we also have um, people from outside of Minnesota who are collaborating with faculty members here 
And then we also have active engagements with um, the private sector. Um, so we work with, we have a number of private partners who, similar to the federal government, are asking us to do research that they sponsor. And, and then the sort of last class is we do actually just provide our services um, as just that, a service. So we um, charge for access to some of our data storage and some of the cycles that we have on some of the big machines that we operate. Um, the current director is Claudia Newhouser, and she is the uh, associate uh, vice president for research and oversees what we call research computing. And I think, actually, come on in. We just got started. I think there's a seat right over there. Great to see. There is now, um, just actually within the last couple of years, an organization called Research Computing. Research Computing not only houses the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, but also the University of Minnesota Informatics Institute, which is a relatively new organization, um, and U-Spatial, which has actually been around for quite a while um, and provides, as the name implies, uh, spatial data sets as well as the expertise to know how to use them. So these are other resources, actually, that are under research computing that if you want to know something about, uh, we'd be happy to tell you um, uh, how you can uh, interact with these other organizations. Within the Minnesota Su Supercomputing Institute, we basically have five functional groups. And if you were to just use our services, you might only interact with our user gateway group and perhaps one or two of the solutions group. Um, the solutions group, those three center groups uh, on this slide, typically are working on funded research or on projects that are very focused on keeping sort of the organization going in various ways. But obviously our user gateway group is very much engaged with onboarding people, developing the interfaces like our website and um, and the dashboard that you use to get resources uh, for MSI. The Systems Administration Group or the Advanced Systems Operations Group, um, they will often respond to support tickets when um, the, the, the front help desk uh, can't answer the question. So they'll often get these tier two type tickets um, that are beyond what the uh, help desk is able to answer. So that's how we're organized, you really shouldn't have to worry about that very much, um, but sometimes it's good to know sort of what it looks like under the hood. Um, our goal or our vision is really to foster innovation and research through advanced research computing, and more uh, and more that means actually interacting with your data as well. So uh, I don't know how many folks here are actually in life sciences. Life sciences. So a number of hands came up, um, at least a third um, uh, of the people here, and that's more and more what we're seeing. And it's great to see that. Actually, my background, my PhD is in, in biology as well, and I work on phylogenetic algorithms. And so there are a lot of the uh, life sciences that have um, become much more computationally uh, um, uh, sort of pinned and they're certainly uh, dealing with data sets that are enormous and often beyond what our typical laptop or desktop actually can handle. So it's great to have you here, and you certainly have a place at, at MSI as far as uh, what we're doing, what we're hoping to support at a high level. So just to give you a sense of actually where things fall very recently, if we just looked at who is using our systems from the standpoint of the CPU hours, we would see, not surprisingly, that a lot of the CPU hours are taken up by the physical sciences, uh, chemistry in particular. Um, but if we change that view and we actually look at how people are using our systems with respect to data storage, then you can really see how life sciences plays a big role here at MSI. And so I understand that some of these categories are kind of weird. These are self-reported uh, from the PIs who use our systems. So biology, genetics, health sciences um, are using uh, the predominant amount of our data storage. 
whereas the computing very often is a little more episodic than, say, for example, computational chemistry, where they often have really long queues and are really uh, utilizing uh, the majority of our cycles right now. Well, so in, in addition to sort of those just very simple elements, we also have labs um, scattered around um, campus. Um, one, the SDVL, is the one that you're in right now. And so this is where we typically hold our tutorials and workshops and stuff like that. Um, we have a really cool Viz Lab downstairs on the first floor. If you've ever just come in through the library and sort of walk from one end of the building to the next, you would actually see uh, some glass windows. And behind that is our visualization lab. That lab is actually available to you um, and can be scheduled directly now through our website just by putting your name on it and then getting access to it. We do, if you send a ticket to help, uh, we'll actually enable your card to access that lab. Um, it is a very cool lab, as I mentioned. It's just been updated um, so that we have three um, backlit uh, 4K resolution um, screens that form a single consolidated desktop uh, that is enormous, that it's at least as big as this room um, from screen to screen. And it's a ideal, re it, it would be an ideal resource, for example, if you really wanted to um, show someone what you're doing where, for example, your typical screen simply doesn't have enough real estate. So if you were doing, you know, a large scale sort of um, uh, mapping project and you wanted to so show, you know, a, a large portion of the world um, in, in one sort of consolidated view, downstairs is a really good place to do that. And that project that I just mentioned is not at all hypothetical. We have some groups in CSE who are doing some really cool stuff with um, uh, satel satellite data as well as sort of just the Google API uh, to map out some interesting phenomena from insect infestation to um, actually discovering uh, illegal dams in the Amazon. And they use that large format uh, screen specifically for that. That was just updated, um, as in it's just being made available, and we'll have three open houses in the next month um, to show people what that's about. Um, in addition, we have smaller labs, um, one over at Niels Hasimo, um, uh, one on Delaware, and then we also have another teaching lab over on the St. Paul campus in the Cargill building. And so we offer these same tutorials actually uh, here and there so that uh, people who are on the St. Paul campus can actually participate uh, in person. I hesitate to say live because we're actually live streaming right now. So maybe we have people at, you know, on the St. Paul campus joining us that way. Um, the main office and the, the main sort of location for MSI administratively is, is here on the fifth floor. Uh, we also have um, offices on the, the, the basement floor as well. Um, some of our systems administrators are down there. So, so that gives you hopefully sort of a high level view of sort of what, what we're doing here, who we are. Um, from the standpoint of, I think, again, the things that you're interested in, the services, uh, we offer batch scheduled HPC, which I'm actually going to show you what that means if you don't know what it means right now, interactive HPC, and I'll also give a demo of that. We also support web um, portals and databases. Those can take on a couple of different forms. From a service standpoint, we have um, web portals like Galaxy um, where, for example, you can go in and you can run next-gen sequencing software without sort of having to know the command line uh, of that. So I'll show you a bit of that as well. Um, also within that area of web portals and databases, we have a group of developers here um, who will help actually develop some of these interfaces. So for example, Galaxy um, Multiomics, Galaxy Multiomics is a project that is supported in part uh, with some of the MSI staff here. So they're actually doing some of the development work with one of our professors in uh, biochemistry um, to extend that interface to serve, um, to serve the biochemistry uh, field. And then the last, uh, and of course not least, is data storage. And I'll go over some of the data storage 
um, equipment that we have and how you can interface with that equipment in particular. So the systems that we have, um, the ones that sort of are our, our, our big iron systems are Masabi, uh, that's the most recent one, and Itasca, that one uh, actually was purchased uh, and installed in 2010, so that one's being phased out, and Masabi is really becoming now the prominent system to support the workloads that we have here. Generally, we refresh our supercomputers every five years, so we're in the process now of saving up funds so that um, in two years, uh, about three years actually, uh, we will be replacing or we'll be getting a new system uh, that will eventually replace Masa Masabi. So the goal here, and if you're a graduate student, I think this is especially, should be especially reassuring, is that we always have some compute in play and that we don't have these sort of large gaps of punctuated space where there's nothing available for you to do your work. That could be extremely frightening, for example, if you're developing a workflow, you're doing analyses, and you have to defend your dissertation, and guess what? We're replacing the supercomputer. That, that, that doesn't happen. These things actually overlap, just as these two systems have overlapped now for a number of years uh, to provide that continuity. Um, the systems that we get are big. Um, <laughs> so. They're on the order of about uh, six to seven million dollars when we purchase them. And they typically rank within the top five university owned systems in the US. And that's important to distinguish because you've probably heard of other centers that might have systems that are funded by the federal government. Those systems are typically then allocated to people all over the country. Ours is different. We own, the University of Minnesota owns it and the allocations are made to our faculty, staff, and students, um, first and foremost. So that gives a lot more throughput. The compute and the data storage go to uh, the University of Minnesota. So that separates us. These are other institutions who have similar uh, systems. So that, that I'm just trying to compare apples to apples in this case. All right, well I didn't want to go on talking too long so I'm going to pause now for a minute, ask if there are any questions, and then what I want to do is I actually want to show you what it is to actually submit a batch scheduled job from start to finish. And, it, and, and hopefully let you see that it's not that intimidating. It's pretty straightforward. Again, there's an entire tutorial on this, how to master the scheduler. And so I'm going to go kind of quickly over, over each of these examples, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of what it is to that, that you would do in that area. Any questions up till up to this point? Yes. So can you use the example of the Amazon scheduler for Windows because I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Or not. Yeah, great question. So so the question was um, do we need to get access, special access to to MSI to be able to use um, that resource? And the answer is yes. Um, the way that that works is um, if you are not a faculty member here um, then um, and the designation would be that you would need to be a tenured faculty member so if you're if you have some other staff designation um, then we can get a, an, a, an exception to you uh, for you so that you would be able to sponsor your own account and others as well but you're automatically not given that unless you're a tenured track faculty member if you're a tenure track faculty member, um, then um, you can sponsor accounts. And if you're a graduate student or postdoc, then you would simply ask your, the professor that you're working with to sponsor you. And then they would make their allocations available to you by having you under their account. And they do that by logging into the MSI website, logging into their dashboard, and they simply type in your UMN ID and say yes. And so it's that easy. Um, once, you, once you get added, then you can begin to use MSI resources, all of the MSI resources that I'll talk about today through that person's account. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And those are the 600, we actually have 700 uh, PI accounts that I was referring to. So we have 700 
faculty members who actually have accounts and then they have any number between one and we have some groups that have over a hundred students under them sponsored and um, so that that's how you go about it and I'll touch upon that a little bit at the end but that was a really good question any other questions before I get into the the demo of a batch schedule job all right cool so what, uh, what you do then to access um, uh, the, the, the sort of traditional supercomputing uh, capabilities that we host is you typically bring up a terminal, just like I've done. And if this is not large enough for you to see, just let me know. But what I'm going to do here, would people like to see it larger? Maybe a little bit. Um, what you would typically do is you would use a program called SSH, the secure shell, and then you would enter your, um, your UMN ID, which is also your MSI username, and then you would specify using the at symbol what system you want to log into. We make it pretty easy. We call it uh, login.msi.umn.edu. So you type in that string, you hit return, and then you type in your, oops, your password. And at this point now I've logged in, right? So I am now sitting on what we call a bastion node. So I'm not on a node that does any computing, but rather a node that protects the rest of the systems behind it <coughs> from, from people doing bad things. And, and so I, at this point, need to get to the compute resource where I'm going to actually run a job. That's pretty easy. I just type in SSH Masabi and hit return. And then again, it will ask me for my password and I just type that in. And now I'm actually on a compute node. I'm on a, a node that will then allow me to set up a job that will run somewhere on this giant system called Masabi. Okay, so that's the starting point. There are ways to shortcut that if you're doing it a lot and you're, and you're good at the terminal. Um, again, th I'm not going to go over those things, but I do want to alert you that there is a Linux tutorial, and I'll show you when that is at the end. And if you're, if you're not great with various sort of Linux commands, I recommend you check that out. It's a great tutorial, um, but uh, I'm going to assume that you have some Linux liter literacy for this, but... Um, not much. All right, so once I land on this compute node, I type ls to see where I'm at. Okay, I'm in this directory, very messy directory, and I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to where I have a demo set up, which is somewhere here. <laughs> it's under batch tests. So I type in batch test, and there's lo and behold a program in there called Clustall, and so I'm going to reveal my biology roots and I'm going to take a set of sequences, a set of DNA sequences that are currently unaligned and I'm going to use a software package called Clustall to align those sequences in a way that I can do other analyses, right? You don't have to worry about the detail, but this alignment um, can for very large sets of data take a long time and so and HPC is a great place to do that because I can also then just submit it and walk away, have a cup of coffee, do some other work, uh, come back, and then I can have actually the finished product without tying up my desktop. And so um, I'm going to show you just a little bit about what that is. If I do an LS, I'll see I have that um, FASTA sequence um, in my home directory, and it looks kind of like a mess. Um, unaligned uh, sequences and I've got another file already created which is actually the one that you'll want to see and so I'm going to use a command called less um, just to see this thing called clustal run that is my submission script that is the heart of how I get these jobs to run on Masabi in a batch scheduled way where I don't have to interact with it so batch would be synonymous with sort of shoot and forget, right? Submit it and not have to worry about it. So this is a, this is a really simple 
uh, batch script. You can create as many of these as you want. You can launch um, almost as many of these as you can want, uh, as you want. And so the first um, bits of information just sort of tell um, tell the uh, scheduler that this is a bash script, and then then I have a note about sort of what this is doing, and it's just a personal note for me, um, and I protect that note with the with the pound sign, and then these other PBS pound PBS um, uh, notes are actually parsed by the scheduler, so they're they're actually read by the scheduler and tell the scheduler information that would be useful for it to know. The first thing is it tells the scheduler that the name of this job submission is called Clustall W. Now that's important because if you start, okay, I get the hang of it now, I'm gonna just start firing off jobs. You may wanna know what those jobs are and you can identify them if you give them names that make sense to you. So this is a way to do that, to name the job so that when you query the scheduler, the scheduler returns something that you can make sense of. The next um, PBS command, the M, um, is um, informing the scheduler that you would like to be notified if the job um, aborts, that's the A, in other words, if it just dumps without a reason that the scheduler is aware of, uh, or the job begins, or the job ends. Those three things, if those three things happen, you will get a message from the scheduler that they happened. And that's really great, right? Because if you set up these long running jobs, you can, you know, again, get other work done, not have to be, you know, not have to check in constantly. You just wait for the email message. When the email message comes through, it's gonna mean that the job either started, ended, or aborted. And either way, that might require some action on your part. So be aware, if you're, if you're getting clever though and you're setting up scripts to generate these scripts, so you generate, let's say, 100 jobs, you can generate a lot of email for yourself pretty quickly if you have this command on, right? And that happens to people. And sometimes people borrow scripts from their friends and they weren't aware of this feature and they start running them and they get a lot of email messages and they send a, a support message to us saying, there's something broken with your system, it's spamming me. And we very nicely, of course, say, it's actually what you asked the script to do. If you delete this line, it, you won't get any more messages. So this whole part, the guts of what I'm showing you right now, is the topic of another tutorial and I'll show you the date for that. But I did want you to see what this looks like. Um, the next cue, I'm sorry, the next command basically combines the um, standard output with the standard error. So I get one log file of both of those things. If you don't know what standard error and standard out is, you'll get that in the Linux tutorial. Um, Q uh, is telling me that I want you to run this on um, a specific queue that MSI supports, a job scheduling queue. If you don't know what that is, we have again a specific tutorial on this whole job scheduling, batch scheduling stuff. So um, don't worry about that now. And the last line in these commands basically tell the job scheduler how much time I need for this job to run and how many nodes and how many processors on that node I will need. Again, this will be discussed in great detail in another tutorial. The last line, um, now the sort of substance, now that the, the scheduler is set up, actually tells the um, scheduler to change directories into this working directory that you see that I'm in right now, and then run this program called clustile w2 with the following input commands. So this is what you would do on the command line. This is what I'm telling the script to do. With this, you should really, your imagination should just be going crazy. I'm never gonna have to sit in front of a computer again clicking buttons. I could just construct scripts like this and just run um, out, you know, I could, I, could, I could take over the world, right, with this. You could run so many scripts. And it is possible, actually, to be incredibly productive just with this core kernel of information. All right, so I'm gonna escape out of that. It's all, 
it's all set and I'm using a an editor called VI which you don't have to learn um, and now that I've gotten here I'm going to um, use another command called QSub and I'm going to as an argument to QSub give it the command file that you just saw and hit return and lo and behold that returns to me a job identifier and um, I can now uh, use another command called qstat with my username to see what it's doing. And it has already completed. Um, so it, it started pretty quickly. And if it was, if it was still running, uh, I would have an R. Um, or if it was still sort of sitting there, I would have another command. And you can see, actually, I have the output file. So you'll see sl underscore 12 s dot out. So if I do ls again, sl, and do 12 s, I now have an aligned output file. And so, um, so that's, that's sort of a really quick view of how you would submit a job via the, the batch schedule, scheduled mechanism. Any questions? Any questions on that? Again, really fast. Um, all of those elements are covered in much greater detail uh, in our, um, sorry, I'm just going to view, okay, um, in, our, in our tutorial. So, um, so you'll get a much better sense of that <laughs> later. Any, any questions though, general questions? Okay. Yes. Great question. Um, it depends on the queue. So there are limits. We have, we have six or seven different queues. And in some cases, you can run hundreds of jobs at the same time. And these are typically small jobs. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's completely dependent upon which queue you submit it to. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Good question. Oh, great! You're gonna love the rest of this. <laughs> there are there if if you the question was are there any resources that MSI supports that have any other interface than Linux? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And and yes. Awesome question. Thanks for asking that. Um, no, you don't. Um, you can be especially the example that I just gave where I was just using a simple terminal, you can be anywhere in the world. Um, the only real prerequisite in that case, if you're off campus, is that you have to use a VPN client. Um, you have to use the University of Minnesota's VPN. And so um, VPN is virtual private network. And when you use the VPN, you actually use your UMN ID to log in um, first to that VPN, it then puts the machine that you log into sort of virtually on the campus network. So from our perspective, it actually looks like you are on the network or, or on the campus network. And that's the only prerequisite. Um, and so when we actually look at people, um, they're all, the majority are coming from outside of campus very often, depending on the time of the year. So you can be situated anywhere. Uh, just remember that if you're accessing MSI resources and you're not on campus, you should be running a VPN. There are instructions. If you just write down those three simple characters and type them into our search bar on MSI's website, you will actually see resources for setting up the VPN. And also, I should say, our interactive tutorial so if you're if you're doing the interactive tutorial spends a little bit more time setting up the VPN so I highly recommend that good questions yes uh, 
excellent question. So the question was, when you submit uh, a job, what order do they run in? Are they sequential or parallel? And the answer is um, they're typically run in parallel. So, um, so for example, if, you, if you're running, they will be submitted serially, but then they may, um, they, they may be, depending on the job requirements in each one, they may be actually started at different times. So if you have a dependency associated, for example, let's say you want to run one job that then outputs files that the other job is going to input, then you're going to have to do some scripting around that to set that up. And so, for example, you might be watching a directory and saying, when this file appears, then start this job, right? And that's something that some people will do. They'll construct um, jobs to uh, wrap software that will need to be run in succession. Does that make sense? But you'll have to do some special programming for that beyond what, what we offer. Yes, it, uh, the question was if we, if we request too many nodes or, or processors or resources, uh, will it be delayed? And, and the answer is yes, it's delayed in a couple of ways. Primarily, the way is that our job scheduler um, has a notion of fair share, right? So it runs on a fair share basis, and it looks at how many resources that you've had over some unit time, and if you've been burning through a lot of your resources at a fairly high rate, then it'll begin to diminish your priority in the queue. And other people who have, let's say, used nothing, just as an easy example, will actually have an elevated priority and will start to get into, you, uh, start to get into the queue faster than you. So the idea is, is that the scheduler is doing the difficult work of trying to make sure everyone has fair access to the system. It can lead to some confusion because it isn't serial, but there's some intelligence in terms of what people have had access to and what other people have been using. Good questions, really great questions. So all of these things really go, we go into much deeper detail in the other tutorials, but I'm, I'm happy to hear those questions here. Any other questions? Okay, stop me at any point if there, there are other questions. Um, what I'm gonna be getting into now really pertains to the question about interfaces. What if you don't have experience or you use software that doesn't actually have a command line interface? Well, you're in luck because we do actually have such resources and we have a couple of different ways to get into those. Um, one is an interface called NICE it's completely web-based and it gives you a, an interface that looks like your standard desktop. The other is we do operate uh, a remote sort of uh, a virtual desktop um, environment uh, or infrastructure. And, uh, and there you can actually get full-blown Windows desktops. And then the last really cool one, which I'm gonna demonstrate, is something called Jupyter Notebooks. And that's a web-based um, interactive system has anyone ever used Jupyter Notebooks before? Jupyter Notebooks? Somebody's heard of it here. H does anyone do Python programming or scripting? Use Python for stuff? Does anyone use R? Some biologists here. Okay, more hands came up. So um, Jupyter Notebooks, or um, also referred to as Jupyter Hub um, in some cases, used to be called IPython. Um, is um, an environment where you can use different programming languages. The two that we support most robustly are Python and R. And so I'm gonna demonstrate that now, just so you can get a sense of what a resource might look like if, for example, you, uh, you didn't wanna use the command line, right? So what I'm gonna type in is, uh, um, I'm gonna just show you the shortcut, nd, dot msi dot umn dot edu is the URL. I'm going to type that in and into my web browser. And then that's going to ask me at this point what group I belong to. So I'm already logged into this web interface. So this would ask you, you know, typically 
you know, what PI group do you belong to? Who is your faculty sponsor? And so I'm MSI staff, so I'll click continue. And um, uh, I have a server running already, it looks like. So I'm going to say stop my server. And then I'm going to say uh, start my server so that this would give you a, a view of what this might look like the first time you logged in. Um, at this point, you're actually able to select what type of computer you want to run on. And, and so uh, some have lots of core and lots of memories and can be run for a long time. Others have a small number of cores and a small amount of memory and only run for a small amount of time. Pop quiz, <laughs> which do you think is going to be easier to get on? This where I heard somebody say, the smaller, 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 right? So if you're asking for lots of resources, there's probably going to be more contention to get on that system. So I'm going to select the one uh, with the smallest amount number of cores, the smallest amount of memory, and the smallest wall clock time. And I'm going to hit spawn. Okay, and at this point now, what it actually is doing is it's reaching out to Masabi, and it's going to place my job on Masabi. Um, and so you get a pause here as that action is occurring, but notice that except for typing in my password uh, and username, uh, I didn't have to do anything with the terminal. So that's, that's a good thing if, if you don't want to use the terminal. And I'm, again, yes? It dies, yeah. So you don't, you, you really, you want to use this if you're interactively working with the data and maybe running analyses that are relatively short. You see what I mean? Um, if it's, yeah, if it's going to take longer than what you see up there, at that point you should really talk to us about figuring out how to turn this into a batch schedule job. You see what I mean? Because then you just don't want to tie up a resource where people are trying to, to get more responsive um, feedback. Very good question. Um, so I have a notebook that's already set up and I'll walk through that notebook just quickly so you can see uh, how this is a handy handy tool to use. Um, I have now we're back into programming <laughs> a little bit but you can see um, hopefully from this example that I have some scripts and one of these scripts is in my home directory and it's um, it's a set of, uh, it's some data that I downloaded from NIH about sort of availability of various types of sequences. And I want to plot that. And so I'm going to use um, a, a Python program called uh, matplotlib. And so if you're familiar with Python, this is just sort of initialization of an environment, uh, bringing in various libraries that are already installed on the system. So if you're a Python user, you could get really excited really quickly because you don't have to install all this stuff on your laptop, which can sometimes be tricky. Um, it's already installed on MSI, and I'm just executing each of these code blocks right now, um, and it's setting things up. Now, at this point, it's going to parse a large file and then do um, a big plot. And so it's computing right now. You actually already saw the plot, but you know, <laughs> I wanted to make sure it worked. So, and so there is the plot um, of um, eukaryotic and prokaryotic and virus sequences that are currently contained within uh, some of the nation's genome uh, databases or genomic databases and their size as well. And so you can set this up actually in clever ways to pull that data directly. Uh, from remote databases and create plots so that you would just go in your notebook and you could actually rerun those analyses and get a visualization then of, of that, of that um, data. And so that's kind of a clever way also if you're running a batch job, you might set up a viewer in whatever your fa favorite language that is. Um, R, for example, has some outstanding plotting features and then you could plot that data that you've actually run on Masabi or on our HPC systems. Because I'm looking right now at my HPC file system. All right, so that's one way to get interactive. I want to show you one other, and that, that's called NICE. 
And this is much closer to, I think, what you were hoping for. So I type in my credentials. Oops, sorry. There's my name. Type in my password. Now at this point, again, I have a number of resources that are available to me. I'm going to pick um, a shorter run time, uh, even though it has more memory, and that's going to start up. But you're going to get this sort of spinning wheel until the resource is made available to me. And, oh, I selected. I'm going to start up another non-GPU resource. Oh, it gave me it, so I'll... Oops. Okay, so it downloads a file. I'll connect to that, and lo and behold, what do I have? I have a standard Linux graphical desktop. And, um, and so, again, I think that's getting sort of closer to what you were asking earlier, where if you don't have command line experience, uh, I now have a standard browser. Um, I can actually go in and run um, examples um, that would otherwise need to be run by the command line. So I'm opening up, for example, in this particular case, uh, Clustall, the same program that I was running through the batch scheduled system. It's actually a different build. Um, and, but I can load some sequences. Lo and behold, I see my file system just like I did before. And I can go to um, batch tests so I can grab that same FASTA file, open it, and view it fully interactively, but nothing is running on my desktop. It's all running on a Masabi node remotely. And so I'm doing, in many respects, the same analyses that I did during the batch scheduled example that I gave you, but I'm doing it interactively. And so there's lots of software that you can install in your home directory. There's some that is available as part of the standard software that's available at MSI that you can take advantage of that is interactive in this desktop environment, right? There is also, as I mentioned, a Windows environment but we tend not to support as much software within Windows. And so really what you want to look for is whether or not there is software that's available for Linux and if it has a graphical uh, component to it. And this, this um, uh, Clustall package actually does. All right. So we've now seen two ways that you could sort of use the interactive components of MSI. We've seen one way that you can submit a batch scheduled job. Does anyone have questions about those sort of general modes of access? Any questions? This is a really good group as far as uh, great questions <laughs> coming from, from this group. So if we were Windows, yes. Could you ask that question one more time? So if I were Windows, yes. I need to do the work in time and I want my GPU to be now. Um, would this work as well as batch or would the schedule only have to run for a certain amount of time? Um, it depends on the length of time that your job requires. I think if both of them are, I mean, so you had a virtual desktop before, where was that run? I see. Yeah, mm. Oh, I see. So I would have to have the same skill. So I would I have to have multiple skills to have the work in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. What software were you running? Faster? What yeah, what I was thinking of the way that Clustal works. Yes, okay. And then what programs were you running? within that Linux environment? I, I used to use a lot of the Debugger and Masabi before I had to do the batch scheduling. Oh, I see, right. So, for instance, I used to do a lot of the Debugger and Masabi. 
And so the virtual desktop is primarily just on your Windows system to have a command line access? Yes. Ah, I see. I see. Gotcha. It's a little easier, I think. I think it's a little easier um, if I understand the question correctly, and that is sort of how, again, do you connect to MSI resources if you're on a Windows machine, mm -hmm. which isn't always very well geared toward uh, things like SSH and, and these command line access things. There is actually software um, that runs natively on Windows, so you wouldn't have to run, for example, a virtualized system to get access to uh, command things like SSH. Um, you can use PuTTY, um, and I think actually a lot of our examples are built around PuTTY. Have you guys used PuTTY before? I saw, yeah, you're using PuTTY often, yeah. So, so that's that's kind of one of the preferred ways. Then you don't, I mean. The other options like running VirtualBox and these other sorts of infrastructures on top of your Windows machine, that's kind of heavyweight. Um, if you're just trying to log on um, uh, to the do the batch scheduled things. If you're doing any of the things that I just showed in the second part, the interactive part, you don't need anything except your web browser in both cases. That's all you need is your web browser, right? Yeah. Yes. That's correct. If you if you're already using Putty, is the is the question or the point, um, and it's already installed. That's all you need, or pick your other whatever favorite SSH program because there's a number of Windows ones out there, and then of course natively um, the uh, terminal is built into to Mac. Other other questions? Yes. Uh huh. No, no. For 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 the interactive part that I just demonstrated, like Jupiter, you do not need to um, uh, specify a system like I did when I first started, where I went, I used SSH Masabi. That's completely unrelated. Um, all of your access for Jupyter, and all of your access for NICE is through your web browser. So you use Firefox, or use um, um, Chrome, or Safari. Uh, what is Windows browser? Internet Explorer. Um, you can use that too, um, because everything's done actually through the browser, all the rendering and all the commands and it's through a secure uh, link um, that you would be connecting. Right, so um, if you're connecting to resources on Masabi, um, because you have that option, yeah, then you can still access it there. The difference is, and what, what you need to be uh, clear about is that, or what I should be clear about is that um, not all of the software on uh, Masabi runs in a graphical version. Like for example, I showed you a version of Clustall that I ran on the command line, and then I brought up Nice, and I, and I ran Clustall in in interactive mode with a graphical interface, pull down menus and so forth, so I never had to enter a command. But those are two different builds. Those are two different software uh, packages. They're the same sort of back end, but one has developed a front end interface and the other has not. Good questions, great. Any other, any other general questions before I get into storage? Yes. No, no. When you're connecting, so the question is, when you're when you're using uh, you're using Linux, you have a Linux laptop, right? And you want to connect to the Windows uh, Citrix environment. Um, 
you, um, you will not be connecting to Masabi first. You'll actually be connecting directly to that Citrix environment through the, through, um, the web interface. That's right. It's, a, it's actually a separate, our Citrix Windows environment is not running on Masabi. It's running on its own hardware. And so we have, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a server hardware, I mean, and there's specialized resources on it, but it's actually separate from our supercomputer resources. You would, you would connect in one of the ways that I just described. If you, for example, wanted to use software that is on Masabi, then you would connect in one of the two ways that I just described. Either through, through NICE or Jupyter or through the command line. And then you're actually u utilizing the said resource and, and um, the software that has all the functionality associated with that. All right. Jump in if you've got other questions, really good, good questions from everyone. Um, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about storage because that can often be a point of confusion. And, and it can be confusing sometimes because we do support now multiple storage platforms. And, um, and while most of the time uh, you will be using a single uh, global namespace, we say, in other words, you will be using, if you're looking at the slides, we'll be using the high performance storage system. So I'll show you this specifically, but when you log into one of those nodes and type ls, you see the same files no matter what node you log on to. And so when I went in through those three different interfaces, I'm seeing the same files, literally, right? It's a distributed file system, so it actually is mounted on all of these compute resources. Now. What happens, though, when you start using up all your storage allocation because you've downloaded, what kind of data do you do, deal, deal with? Like tests and stuff. And you've got, you've got now uh, 20 terabytes of test data. That's a lot of test data, isn't it? And, but you could have a huge amount of test data where you're only going to be actively utilizing, let's say, five of those terabytes. Well, there are other options to move that 15 terabytes onto a storage system that is less active and doesn't take up your allocation. That's what I want to show you about right now. And so what I have up here on the slides is I have, we have about uh, a little over now 4.1 petabytes of data storage on our primary storage system. And that's the system that you see everywhere. We have now another system called tier two storage or second tier storage, and we have a little over three petabytes of tier two storage. And you can um, use that to offload some of the data from the primary storage onto that secondary storage so that you stay within your allocation, right? So the second tier storage, as the name implies, might be storage that you use for holding data until you're ready to analyze it. That's one use. Another use is that this is available to people anywhere in the world, in a way. Um, the way that it's available is through a URL. Um, it you, we use something called S3, the Amazon Simple Storage Solution, um, to, to share data with people in other locations. And so that's a possible way also, or the possible reason why you might want to use it. And then we do have archive storage um, that's available as well. And most of the time, you're not going to be using that. But some, some of the people who have been here a long time <laughs> might have a lot of storage that they want to store on the tape. And that's an option available at a cost. So that's why I don't dwell on that. But it is, there is long-term archival storage available at, a, at an extra cost. So if you're new to the university, you're going to hear a lot about storage, and I wanted to sort of put us in perspective as far as other storage um, um, systems on campus. 
we're not the only storage system on campus. Uh, we support primarily from your perspective this high performance storage which we call Panassis and tier two which is actually back ended by Ceph and you don't need to worry about the Ceph part. But remember OIT, our central um, IT organization also supports things like Google Drive. They also have Isilon storage and they have dedicated sort of block storage as well. So those storage systems are also available for you um, and you know you probably use Google storage. Who here uses Google storage a lot for stuff? Yeah, you can, it's unlimited. So you can really put a lot of data on that. That also has a desktop client that synchronizes with the cloud. So if you set it up that way, it's really nice <laughs> to know that your data are effectively sort of off your laptop in case your hard drive broke. Um, at least you'll have it up in the cloud. So there are all these various sort of storage elements. Uh, I'll mention the library has an excellent resource called Drum uh, Data Repository for the University of Minnesota. Um, and so if you've published something and you need to then get a DOI for that published data, you can use the Drum interface and it'll actually give you that um, publication reference uh, for your data. And then within departments also, uh, many people will, um, will um, have storage. So some of the departments uh, also support their own storage. Um, what I want to show you is an interface called Globus, so that, for example, if you didn't want to use a command called SCP, who's used SCP before? S copy, S copy, one person, two people. SCP is like SSH, but it's all command line. And if you weren't comfortable using that, I'm going to show you something called Globus, which is actually quite cool, um, in that it works uh, through a graphical interface. And it also knows if you're, if you're faculty, student, postdoc, uh, or staff here at the U, it knows about you because it actually connects to our systems for authenticating. And so I'll, um, I probably, if I hit login, yeah, good, it, 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 um, I don't have a certificate here. So it says, it looks like you're from the University of Minnesota. Um, if that's true, go ahead and continue and we'll get your credentials from the University of Minnesota. And at this point, it's probably gonna pass me right through. So normally what it would do is it would bring up the University of Minnesota's authentication page and you would authenticate there. But because I just authenticated recently, it keeps a certificate so you don't have to do it every time, which is kind of handy. And so now that I'm in, I can actually select, well, what storage do I want to see? And so I'm going to go and I'm going to see, I'm going to see my, my main home directory on Panassas, for starters. And so um, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's eventually going to render um, my entire uh, MSI uh, file directory, hopefully. It's odd that it's taking this long. <laughs> Normally it pops right up. We'll see what it does. Pause, pause. While that waits, I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to get the tier two storage. Hopefully that, there, that, that worked. I don't know why the Panassas one isn't working. So this is um, using the exact same credentials that I had. Um, my, my MSI credentials, which are also my U of M credentials. I have now a series of, of buckets or, or directory-like things. Okay, I don't know why, there it goes, great. So now I have my primary storage, my high performance storage, and now I have the secondary storage in two windows. Now this is cool because again, I have not typed in any commands like scopy. I see my file systems. It's a nice intuitive graphical interface. I can slide this to the side if I'm, for example, getting work done over on my, my nice interface here. None of this is going on on my system, right? So I can be on my laptop, which has, let's say, very little compute 
power, very little memory, very little storage, but I have a supercomputer working for me now. And I'm actually looking at petabytes of data in terms of the file system that I'm on. And I can take some of those old files and I can move them into um, some other space. So I'm actually going to, under my main bucket, I'm going to move this library, I'm going to copy this library of information from my primary storage into my secondary storage. And all I have to do then is select the directory where I want it to go, select the directory that I want to go there, and hit the direction that I want to move it. And so once that happens, that file transfer actually is going on in the background. Globus operates as a service, so at this point I can log off if it's a long copy, and it'll just continue to copy in the background. I can close my laptop, and it'll keep happening. And so for those of you who've used S-Copy, there would be a problem. It would stop. In this case, it keeps going. And then it informs me, actually, when it's finished um, that activity. And so if I go under activity, it'll say, um, well, it just finished a few seconds ago. And, and it'll give me a, a whole sort of record of, of how fast it went, when it completed, if there were any issues. It does, it does all kinds of great things for you and is a great way to transfer information from the primary storage into the secondary storage. Now, it can also be used to transfer data from your laptop up to MSI. That's also possible. There's a client version of this that runs on Windows, and it runs on Mac and Linux. It's called Globus Personal. You download it. It's a double-clickable install, and you can transfer large sets of data in the same way that I just did using that graphical interface from your laptop up to MSI, right? So that's a cool way. You don't have to use that interface, though. You can use any SFTP program. I've got a head nodding here. Who's used a nice graphical FS, uh, uh, SFTP program? It's FTP, File Transfer Protocol, but S, it means it's secure, so it uses a secure method. Has anyone used those before? Is yes? Mountain Sorry? Is it Mountain Duck? Mountain Duck? Yeah. Oh, I've heard of Cyber Duck before. Yeah. Oh, you pay. Okay, so that's the. Yeah, so you probably get a few more features. Yeah. 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 Nice. So it looks looks like it's literally part of your file system. Well, I'm I'm glad you raised that because there are great software packages if you're if you're a f kind of nervous about using command line to transfer files that actually look like MSI's file system is sitting on your desktop. So CyberDuck or, or Mountain Duck, um, Transit is another one, Transit. Um, and there are just a huge number of programs that do this, and they give you really nice windows of your files that are local and also those files that are in MS on MSI. This is just a great way when you have huge payloads, when you have lots of, if you're doing terabytes of, of student data or what have you, this is the way to do it. All right, questions? All right, well, I think we're probably getting close to the end. We are getting close to the end of time, uh, our time here. Um, this is just um, the storage demo um, that I gave. What I wanted to say is we do have a new um, archive tier. As I mentioned, there is a cost associated with it, but it is a way for you to, if you have really valuable data that you're not using, perhaps this would be a good option for you. Uh, yes? Um, the great question. So with MSI Access, can you access all of the different storage tiers? The answer is no. Um, the answer is yes to tier one and tier two. So primary and secondary, yes. Once you get an account, you have access to those two tiers. 
but tier three actually you need to purchase. So that's the only one that you wouldn't access. The tape archive, yes, sorry. Yes, good question. Tier three, as I referred to it, is really the archive storage. Great question. Okay. Yeah, the way to do it, so once, let's say you run a bunch of analyses, um, the, the data will stay there until you move them. Mm -hmm. And what we recommend is you sort of develop a plan that maybe, for example, after you've, um, you know, done a project and the project is in a directory mm -hmm. that you could maybe um, tar it up or use any sort of compression software that's available to package it. And then, um, and then you don't want to get rid of that, so you could move that to tier two, uh, where it will reside under some name. And then if you need it back, you can simply use that interface that I showed you, Globus, to pull it back onto primary storage. Unpack it, and then you can use it again. If some, so it's an easy way, some, sometimes you'll publish a result, and somebody will say, how did you do this? Or can I have that data set? That's one way to do it. New to MSI's portfolio is a, is a system called Stratus. And Stratus I just mentioned very briefly because uh, we do have separate tutorials for using this system. It is a true cloud-based system. And it is um, typically only used for people who are, who are working with secure or protected data from typically NIH. And, but it is available, and it's available at a cost. So this is not a resource that you would automatically have access to. Um, it's really set up specifically for people who are dealing with um, restricted um, access data. Um, I mentioned Galaxy, and Galaxy is another one of our interactive resources. Um, I can just show you that real quickly. Um, Super easy, again, I brought up a browser and I just type in galaxy.msi.umn.edu, hit return. At this point, I've already logged in, so the browser knows that I'm part of MSI, and I can begin to do additional analyses. Now, I should mention, I could do the exact same analysis that I've been doing through this demo here, but in the interest of time, I won't. Um, the software is here to do multiple sequence alignments. I could look at that same FASTA sequence file that I've been actually analyzing differently on all of these platforms. And so, you know, really three ways to do the same thing. You can't beat that. <laughs> you have lots of different options um, in this particular case intentionally. And it's true, actually, for a lot of the analyses that you might be interested in, is that there's multiple ways to do it. You could do it in a batch environment. You could do it through one of those graphical interfaces I showed earlier, or you could do it in Galaxy, this whole workflow. So lots of different ways to do, do the same type of work. All right, let me go back here. And um, these last couple of examples are, are pretty much just to let you know that we do, in addition to the services we provide, we do sponsored research. Um, this is an example of an interface um, for the Bell Museum uh, that was built uh, by some of our staff members. It's a database front end. Um, we have more complicated sorts of front, end, front ends that we're creating, like the one for the Food Protection and Defense Institute, um, where they have sort of a, um, a console showing uh, various aspects of our food distribution system and perhaps alerting people to if there are things that might be um, interrupting important supply components. Um, software, we have a ton of software packages available, um, at least 400, um, and we typically classify them in a variety of different ways, um, and those are available, actually, a listing of those on our website. Um, the, there are some packages that we restrict access to because there's only a certain number of licenses, in which case then we actually 
uh, use a sort of a calendaring thing to make sure that everyone has access to it who needs access to it. Um, importantly, when you run into issues, um, we have a help desk. We also do consulting and so forth, workshops and tutorials. Um, if you run into an issue and you can't find, I mean, the, the, the fastest way really to get an answer is to go onto our website and type in the search bar and see if there's some existing documentation uh, for the question you have. If, if you don't see anything, then just bring up your favorite email client, type in um, help at msi.umn.edu and you will get an, uh, and send that um, to us. You'll get a, an automated response back immediately and then within 24 hours we try to get back to you as far as whether or not we can solve the problem or whether we've had to sort of push it up a, a level to one of our other analysts. And so those are the basic ways in which um, you can go about getting support. Um, these are the staff that I referred to, at least most of them that were here on this beautiful, I think, sunny spring day. Um, and they, they operate in numerous different ways. Some, as I mentioned, are, are really working very closely with our researchers here to solve pretty cool problems. Um, others are working um, with our researchers, you, um, to make sure uh, that the systems are working as advertised. And others are working really behind the scenes downstairs in the basement to make sure that all the hardware that makes things go actually works. Uh, lots of collaborations um, uh, and numerous projects um, uh, really make up what we do. Um, for the most part, uh, what we provide is free, um, certainly to UMN faculty and staff um, accessing our systems. Um, it is also free to other academic institutions in the state of Minnesota. So we have a number of faculty from, as an example, McAllister, St. Thomas, and then also some of the further uh, 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 schools uh, throughout the state. Um, Okay, so I, I went over this a little bit before, but I just want to reemphasize that the way that you get access, if you don't have access already, is through uh, one of our tenured faculty members who has a PI account. If they don't have a PI account, it isn't hard for them to get one. All they have to do is go on to our website, click access. Uh, when they actually log in using their UMN ID, that will connect them, that will check to see if their status is up to date and walk them through an application process. The account is typically granted the next day. Um, and then um, a faculty member can appoint a group administrator. So if they don't want to, if they're not doing most of the computing, let's say for a project that you're associated with, they can delegate the administrative aspect of that to, to, to you or to another graduate student. Um, this just goes over stuff that I've already talked about. Um, we, um, the account duration uh, is one year, um, but we've had many people here renew for decades. And the only point here is that every year we um, send our, our, our faculty members a note saying you need to renew your account to let us know that you're still using this system. If they don't renew, then actually account access is, is closed until they do request the account again. Yes? That excellent question, yeah. It, um, if a faculty member requests a new account in September, they actually will be required to renew in November. November is where we do our account renewals. Um, so we do those um, every year in the fall. And so if you just happen to come in before we open up our renewal system, then you'll all of a sudden have to renew again. It should be a one click, I mean a couple of clicks and you're done sort of thing. Uh, but you will have to renew. And then accounts are renewed on the first of the year. So they'll, they'll simply if you, for example, get your account set up in September, as the example was, um, uh, you'll go in in November when you get the notification, 
you'll click this is what I would like for January 1st. When January 1st rolls around, you won't notice any difference. It just jumps into the next year. You'll have new set of allocations and be able to get going. Perfect. Yeah, um, let me show you here, because um, I think this gets to it. Um, there are basically sort of three allocation classes in terms of um, how much resource you would get. When you're a, a new user, your default allocation is 70,000 support units. To give you an idea of what that is in more tangible terms, 14, uh, I'm sorry, 140,000 SU, so twice the, um, twice the um, default allocation would be using a whole Masabi node, 24 cores, for the entire year. So if you could formulate a problem to run over 24 cores for an entire year, that's the equivalent of about 140,000 SUs. So the the default allocation is like running nonstop on 12 cores for an entire year. Does that make sense? As far as trying to kind of equate it to what you might be more familiar with. And so it's a lot of computing. The default is a lot. And so what we recommend is if you don't just, if you're not sure, start with the default allocation. If you get to the point where you're up against, let's say, 90% of your SUs, you've used 90% of them, you just go into your dashboard and you click the button that says request more. Request more SUs or request more storage. And then you'll, you, we turn those around typically within a week. We review them every single week. And the only reason we wouldn't do them in a week is that if you provide justification that is insufficient then we'll send something back saying, could you provide more information about how long you need the storage or something like that. If you're just running out of SUs, the justification is the studies that I'm conducting right now are in that require more SUs and we, so we, we allocate those SUs then. So something that's really interesting. So Yannick, can you explain, uh -huh. can you go through a baseline of how many SUs you In the galaxy, right? Yeah, if you go through year and month, you would think that like you're looking at how much at a time. Yeah. Um, is it the new support you were running, or is it just that specific space you filled up with? Oh, it depends. It depends on the faculty member who's sponsoring you. So the faculty member is the one who essentially has the resource. Even for galaxy. Even for galaxy. Yep. Good question. And the storage sort of works in a similar way where, for example, our default um, is 150 gigs. The majority of our users actually don't use more than that. Um, there is a, a, then a very large number of users that use somewhere between 150 and 5 terabytes, 150 gigs and, uh, and 5 terabytes. And then there are much fewer users who use between 5 and 20 terabytes. If you, if you need over 20 terabytes, there is a way to purchase those then, but you would have to purchase those additional um, uh, storage resources. And last but not least, just where you can get information um, on all of these things. So uh, our website really does have tons of information. Pretty much everything that I've talked about is there. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you will see this recorded today. Um, and so maybe you'll hear yourself um, asking questions because the you won't see anything but me. Um, and um, there are other videos there as well, video tutorials. But I think really what's most important is that you um, attend some if you're interested in any one of these. And the schedule is on our website which I'm bringing up right now. And if you go under uh, news and events, and then just click events, you will see uh, the schedule of tutorials. So uh, next week, for those of you 
who are interested in learning more about the command line, I highly recommend attending Introduction to Linux. It's stuff that you can learn online too, so if you're not available, you can do that. But I highly recommend that if you're interested in just getting some immediate feedback and you're sort of new on Linux, go ahead and go to this workshop or tutorial. It, it, the, uh, it's, a, it's a great introduction and there's um, certainly no shame to, to becoming more proficient in using Linux. Um, right after that, uh, um, that same week on Thursday, is um, a deeper dive into job submission and scheduling. Also, I mean, all of these are great tutorials, so I'll stop saying that. But um, uh, this is a really good way to get into trying to figure out how to leverage the scheduler. So if you've got you know, good proficiency and your imagination is sort of going wild with respect to how you can get jobs done, check this out because it's going to save you time. It's going to tell you which is the right queue to submit to, if you've had queue problems, what to do. Yes? Yes, um, all of these now are online. Um, so all of them, what we do is we record these sessions live via YouTube, and then once they're done, they're available. And so you'll actually have a series of ones uh, that, uh, you know, on the same topic. Um, yeah, so definitely join us um, online or watch the video anytime at your leisure. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome to stick around and ask questions. I was thrilled that you were here uh, today and also very happy that we had lots of great questions. Appreciate it. Thank you.